All right, Termo to Madeline, page 323, the Bailey Creek Sawmill. In a desert country such as the Madeline Plains, it would seem that logging would be far removed from the mainstream of life. And yet, there were heavy patches of timber at various sites in the surrounding mountains. There was timber at Ash Valley and the mountains in back of Likely, high above the Clarks Valley and Tuladad. There were stands of ancient pines, superseded in age, only by their gigantic size. In the mountains, in back of Eagle Lake, Horse Lake, Grasshopper, and Dry Valley, and Bailey Creek, there were huge groves of old timber, never before harvested by any man. All of these areas were logged to one extent or another around in the years following the turn of the century. Each area had its own mill, each varying in size and capability of output. The first attempt to harvest timber in the area in back of Bailey Creek and Dry Valley was made by B. E. and Mehala Shumway of Horse Lake. They located a mill site high up in the mountains about three miles above Dry Valley. To what extent their mill operated is unknown, but they did manufacture lumber for themselves and some of their neighbors. Since that was before the days of the NCO on the Madeline Plains, it is doubtful that the operation at that particular site was too extensive. All transportating of logs and lumber had to be done with horses, and it was a long, long way that they had to be transported, even if they were just going to the nearest neighbor's house. The arrival of the NCO and homesteaders to the Madeline Plains changed the possibility for lumber sales drastically, and there were lumbermen and loggers ready to exploit the favorable situation. In the summer of 1912, H.T. and Ruth Risden of Berkeley bought 280 acres from a string of 2940s owned by George Bailey and the Modoc Land and Livestock Company. Now one of these 40s was situated just a short distance of about a quarter of a mile above the Bailey Reservoir. The remaining six Forties were all situated north and west of that point. It was on the 40 acres near the Bailey Reservoir that the Risdens proposed building their sawmill. They had plans to do, to do their logging on the other 240 acres. The land was sold to the Risdens together with the right to use the water for the sawmill purpose and the watering of cattle and horses and for domestic use. A right-of-way was also sold for them for a wagon road down Bailey Creek Canyon and across the corporation lands towards Termo. It was written into the agreement that the Risdens would keep all sawdust and mill refuge from falling into the Bailey Creek. It was further stipulated that when the land was to no longer be used by the mill and logging purposes, it was to be assigned back to the Modoc Land and Livestock Company or the Bailey family. In 1912, money was easy enough to come by and a sawmill was erected. Production was sporadic the first few years. H.J. Fitz operated the mill the first year after it was built, supervising all the crews necessary to convert standing trees into sellable lumber. Over the next couple of years, the Risdens had trouble finding men to supervise the operation. They began leasing the outfit to Thomas Coulter and Frank Spencer, lumbermen from Sacramento. Eventually, in November of 1919, Coulter and Spencer bought them out. They were to own it for the next 13 years, at the end of which it was all assigned back to the Bailey family. In the first few years, the Coulter and Spencers had control of the mill. They had the same problems, getting qualified help that the Risdens had been having before. Workers were a dime a dozen, as homesteaders everywhere were more than willing to work out during the summers to bring in any kind of income. But skilled labor, men who understood the woods and were capable of handling such an operation, were hard to find. The mill did provide the lumber for most of all the local buildings 
that was going on and even managed to ship a little out on the NCO in those years. Then in the summer of 1917, Coulter and Spencer had the good fortune to be able to hire a man who had the reputation of being the best millwright and small sawmill operator in the country. Bill Scanlon had operated little mills all over Lassen County, Plumas, and Washoe counties, and had always made money for his employers. With his wife, Mary, and their three children, Norman, Bill, and Helen, he moved to Bailey Creek that summer. With the United States having entered the war in Europe that spring, the lumber market was booming in an effort to supply the many needs of the war effort. In fact, Bill and Mary had their oldest son, Norman, who was out of school, stayed there all winter operating the mill that year. The two younger children went away to school. That was the first and possibly the only year the Bailey Creek Mill operated during the winter. But over the next three years, with Bill Scallon at the helm, it operated to peak capacity every summer. The little mill was situated in about as beautiful a spot as could be found. Just below it was the Bailey Reservoir, where the workers could fish on Sundays and after work hours the rest of the days. The spring-fed headwaters of Bailey Creek ran just below the mill, between it and the workers' cabins on the other side of the canyon. On that side of the draw stood a large cookhouse and an office. In the office was a phone, which was connected to the line down on the plain so that the mill had direct contact with Termo and Madeline. There were a few other families who lived at Bailey Creek while the mill was in operation. They ate at home, but all the single men ate at the cook shack. Some of the families who worked there were the Gus and Rachel McCrary family, the Bill and May McCrary family, and Red and Margaret No and their family. Emilio Zamboni ran the woods for Mr. Scallon. He had a 20 to 30 man crew under him who did all the logging. After the fallers had felled the enormous trees to the ground with their two man crosscut saws, limmers would take after the limbs with their razor sharp axes. When the limbs were off, the buckers would come in with one cross-cut saw to make logs of manageable length. Choker cables would be set on those logs, and the Teamsters would skid them into the landing with their four- and eight-horse teams and chains. The McCrarys, who were expert horsemen, were always the head Teamsters. The landing was situated above the mill. The logs were transferred into the mill by a conveyor chute. It generally took several men to dog the logs into the conveyor chute by means of large cant hooks. Down at the mill, operating the boiler and the engine rooms, was Chief Engineer Curly Lavelle. He had a fireman and an assistant helping him. Their job kept the entire mill operating. All the mechanical parts of the entire mill, including the conveyor saws, the log carriage, the planers, edgers, and trams were run by the huge steam engine. Once a log was transferred into the mill itself, the dogger, who was often Norman Scallon, wrestled it into position on the carriage by means of a cant hook as the conveyor pushed it into the place. The dogger rode on the carriage with the setter and sawyer, as it went back and forth on rails past the two enormous circular saws. The Bailey Creek Mill had what was called a shotgun feed carriage. It carried the log past the saw at a slow, even pace and jerked back into position to start the next cut at the speed of lightning. This operation was all controlled by the sawyer, who, of course, was Mr. Scallon, who also gauged the boards and determined the sizes to be cut. The setter man, who was usually Red No, positioned the log according to what Mr. Scallon told him. This was done by means of a huge lever device known as a hill nigger and a turning apparatus known as a Sim Simpson Turner. <laughs>
Once the boards came off the saw, workers ran them through the planer and edger before transferring them to the lumber yard by means of trams. In the lumber yard, which was situated between the mill and Bailey Reservoir, more workers stacked the new lumber, spacing it for maximum drying. Tom Wood was the general handyman around the mill. As a carpenter, he took care of all buildings and repair. As a handyman, he did about anything was called on to do so, including hauling lumber to Termo. The transfer of lumber to Termo was accomplished by means of a team and wagon in the early years. A load of lumber was hauled to the NCO dock and unloaded one day. The following day, the teamster would travel back to the mill and load up for the next day's run. During the years that Mr. Scallon operated the mill and business was booming, Coulter and Spencer bought some trucks to speed up the long haul to Termo. The trucks could go down and back in one day, cutting the transfer time in half. The mill ran six days a week, 10-hour work days running from 7 to 6. Bill Scanton, of course, started early and quit later because saws had to be filed and set hammered into them. Broken and cracked teeth had to be replaced, and so on. And, of course, Curly Lavelle and his firemen had to be on the job a couple of hours early to get the fires stoked and the boilers hot. That way, at 7 o'clock, when the whistle blew, the proper levers could be thrown and the entire system would squeak and rattle into motion with a noise familiar to lumbermen. None of the workers got rich, of course, but it provided a good living, much more secure than farming down on the flat. Skilled laborers like the sawyer and setter were paid as much as 35 cents to 37 and a half cents an hour. The other workers made an average wage of about 30 to $35 a month. The single man would not leave the mill all summer. When the mill shut down in the winter, they would move into Susanville or some such place, rent a cabin, buy a few groceries and a little booze to tide them over the cold spell, and be flat broke in a couple of days. But there was always more work in the woods the next summer. The Bailey Creek Sawmill provided some of the available logging and lumber work for a good many years. All right, next chapter. A chapter titled, Madeline Meadows, The Final Collapse and the End of an Era. Once again, the end of an era comes gradually, and to pinpoint it to one time or to any one cause is not possible. The collapse of the irrigation company in and of itself, did not affect the average person on the Madeline Plains in particular. Some felt it did, but had they owned all the water they needed, they still could not have turned their homesteads into an oasis to get rich. The collapse of the irrigation company was just a tiny breakdown in the colossal disintegration of a much grander scheme all over the West. With or without water, the homesteaders were broke, and the only thing that had kept them on their homestead was the lack of opportunity everywhere else. With the entrance of the United States into the European War in April of 1917, a rapid deterioration of the homestead situation began. New job opportunities gave people plenty of reason to leave the minimum existence they were experiencing on their homestead. The draft and enlistment were taking young men away from their homestead in droves. So when the Madeline Meadows Land and Irrigation Company finally caved in, all of the homesteaders who had blamed it for their troubles did not even take a notice or realize what had happened. The sad realization came to those who had promoted it, those who had gambled everything and lost. In March of 1917, J. Noble Jones had deteriorated under the strain of all the litigation, financial loss, and worry to such an extent that he knew he could never bring the situation out of the hopeless muddle that it was in. He signed everything, property, debts, mortgages, water contracts, and all other headaches, over to trustee Arthur H. Connolly. 
By that time, he and his wife and three small children were destitute and living hand to mouth. Because of all the strain of the affairs collapsing down around him, J. Noble Jones suffered a paralytic stroke, which left him in a state of physical and mental breakdown. Poor Georgia, with three small children to care for, and no means of income, could not care for him. So she loaded J. Noble on the train and sent him to his brother in Washington. When his family in Washington refused to believe that he was broke and started to send him back to Georgia, she was left with no alternative but to divorce him to force them to keep him. It was shortly thereafter that J. Noble Jones died, a defeated, dejected, and totally ruined man at the age of 42. Georgia and her three little children moved back to Alturas and took possession of a ranch there that was a holdover from her father's estate. The one thing she would never sign a mortgage on. Of everything that she and J. Noble Jones had once possessed, it was all that was left, and she would be plagued by lawyers and the loan sharks for years afterwards, trying to get their claws into it or in some other way collect on some long overdue debt. In the meantime, Mr. Connolly was trying to bring a fair and equitable end to the whole mess. And he was not having much success, but now all the country's creditors could see that they were not going to be fully compensated. They all wanted their full amount, or at least the lion's share. Lineup and McCade had everything tied up in court for a while, seeking to have everything reinstated to the condition it was prior to 1910, which, of course, would have placed the whole system back in their hands. In the end, the court did not see it that way. The entire holdings of the company were sold in 1918 to the Nevada Land and Livestock Company. Over the next several years, the company would move itself and prove itself to be far, far more mixed up than the irrigation company had ever been. In a short period, it would go through several owners, banks, receivers, and names. The names included the Nevada and California Land and Livestock Company and the Smoke Creek Livestock Company. The locals knew it as the Smoke Creek Outfit. However, so henceforth it will be referred to under that name. With the sale of the Madeline Meadows properties, the proceedings were divided up among all the creditors, and as usual, everyone but the lawyers went away a whole lot worse for the wear. Lineup and especially Ulti McCabe, far from getting rich under the sh scheme they had started back in 1904, lost their shirts. The banks and loans companies in San Francisco and Chicago, whether solvent or insolvent, big or little, honest or crooked, took a lesson in losing money and going broke from their Madeline Plains. Even though most of the homesteaders were broke before they ever took up the land, there were those among the locals who were hurt by the final sale also. With the exception of two parties, everyone lost their water rights and had to buy new ones under the new system, whether they had made payments on their original contracts or not. If they had made no payment, they were, of course, unaffected because they did not have any equity in the system anyway. If they had made payments, however, they were given no credit for them. And fortunately, these were few, but they still had to buy a new right if they wanted water. And this time, there were no payments. The Pino Place lost its water right to Ultima Cave, had granted to Austin when he assigned a right-of-way to the Thule Lake Land and Irrigation Company back when things were first getting started. When Glenn Talbot bought the first place from Mrs. Pino in 1921, he managed to acquire 30-acre feet for the place on the grounds that either get the water or else the land of the original trade had to go back to him. Besides, he had bought more land which the irrigation canal did not have a right of way across. Conceivably, he could have forced the gate to be closed at the tunnel, stopping everyone's water. The massive Smoke Creek outfit was exasperated as such a nobody being such a thorn in their side. So they started plans to run a heavy cement flume around and over the top of Talbot's land. 
In the end, however, they decided it was far cheaper, even if it did bruise their corporate ego, to give in and let Mr. Talbot have the 30-acre feet. The Boersmans were another family who got hurt in the irrigation company's final collapse. They had made payments right along, and they had converted their property into a fairly nice acreage of meadowland. Discouraged by the loss of their rightful water and with the hope of a better living elsewhere, with or without water, they sold out to Smoke Creek Outfit in 1919 and moved out. A couple of years later, however, Frank Davidson would lease the place from Smoke Creek and use all the water he wanted. Jim Olson was another homesteader who lost out by the final court order. He had traded his original 320-acre homestead on that for 100-acre-foot fully paid water right to the triplet place. That had taken place under the old Madeline Meadows Company. With a final court order and sale, all such contracts were canceled, so Mr. Olson managed to scrape together enough money to buy a new 35-acre-foot water right. The only two places that did not lose their rights entirely were the Williams Ranch and the Bailey Place which the Paulson family was buying. It was rather difficult for the court to ignore the work John Williams had done in the system in exchange for his water, and the Bailey place still held the key to the entire system. Paulsons could bring the whole program to a screeching halt simply by refusing to allow the use of their reservoir. So these two places maintained a water right, although the court did reduce the amounts on paper at least, what all the locals in the immediate vicinity were to learn, if they hadn't already, was that they could take what they needed, and if they stuck together, no judge in San Francisco or corporate director in Reno was going to be there every day with a ruler measuring everybody's water. Typically, John Williams did try to work out a system that would be equitable for himself and all of his neighbors. As soon as a sale of the Smoke Creek outfit went through, he negotiated with them to establish a proper irrigation district for Madeline under the right law. He worked out all the details, and Smoke Creek went along with it. But in the end, something went wrong with the deal, too, and it never came about. Thus, by 1918, conditions had changed drastically. There was no irrigation company, and few people were expecting any water. Because of the job market elsewhere, few people were inclined to be on the Madeline Plains. Empty houses stood everywhere. A new era was dawning on the Plains, but it was not one to be an economic prosperity for anyone. All right, next chapter, titled The War, will continue next time on page 341. Have a great day.